Okay, this November 7th, 2018 meeting of the Oyster River Cooperative School Board will come to order. Um, first order of business is the approval of the agenda. And I would like to make one um, addition to it. Um, it relates to the decision we have about sites. And Ron Lamar is here uh, to uh, talk to us about the site study that was done. So, so uh, and we have some information in the folder about that, but I think to hear from him about whether the tests demonstrate that the, the current, the building, the, the current site is a buildable site. Um, so um, with that change, so I, what I'd like to do is have that right after the approval of the minutes if that's agreeable to people so he doesn't have to sit through long part of our meeting. Uh, as so, fascinating as that would be. Um, so I'm wondering with that change whether we, I can have a motion to approve the uh, agenda. Denise? Our motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Denise, is there a second? Second by Brian. All in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor. Um, <coughs> public comment. Hey. Hi, how are all of you tonight? I'm Lauren Selig, I live uh, right around the corner here in Durham, and um, I came to speak with you guys for a few different reasons. I wrote myself a list so I wouldn't forget, I'll try to be pretty quick. Um, the first is that I have a, one of my two children is an eighth grader at the middle school, and she's getting a lot of really great opportunities in school. But one of the things that I really have yet to understand is why we've got a significant lack of cohesion between the two elementary schools in the district, between the different teams um, in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, so far as I can tell, that there's not consistency across the board about what curriculum is covered, what material is covered. I learned recently that the Mastway Elementary School has a um, student council. I thought that was great, but you know there wasn't one at Moharamet during the time my kids were there, and there's not, as far as I can tell, one at the middle school, and I'm just confused why there's so little coherence across the district and I'm hoping that can get modified in some way to make it, you know, better. Um, the other is that I know we're on our year two of the new grading system and we've added exemplary, which my kids tell me their teachers often forget exists as a new standard. Um, and I'm under the impression the whole goal of this program was to try to alleviate the stress caused by having traditional grades of A, B, C, D and potentially failing. And what I can say is that for my kids, the new grading system is far more stressful. Um, they really have no understanding of where they're really being successful and where they're struggling. They're aware of where they're not meeting standards, but they're not ever clear on when they're really doing their best work and really showing their absolute best. Um, one of my two children would be incredibly motivated by having an honor roll, and she hears about friends in other districts who are very excited about having re reached honor roll in their district. And she's like, well, mom, what is that and why don't I have that? And so it's a problem, you know, that we don't have ways to really honor and recognize the kids who regularly go above the standards. Um, the third issue, and this relates back to the curriculum, is that she's brought up to me several times, she's so frustrated by the fact that kids can be accelerated in math. One of our neighbors in sixth grade started going to the high school for accelerated math curriculum classes, which is great. My daughter is not a math scholar. However, she's really accelerated in language arts and reading and in fifth grade tested at reading at the 12th grade level and is bored to tears in her English classes regularly. If she has to read the short story or the novel Hackett for the fifth year in a row, I think she might pull her hair out. Um, she doesn't have a lot left, but she might pull <laughs> it out. Um, and so, you know, I don't understand and she doesn't understand why there's not a clear way for her to take accelerated courses at the high school, why nobody's ever said to her, oh, you're really great at language arts. We're gonna accelerate you. We get, you're gonna do regular math at your school at, at the appropriate level. And why there's such a disparity between treating kids who are excellent at math and really accelerating them. And her view was that the school district only cares about math and sports. So, coming from, from her lips. Um, <coughs> The other thing, and this is something I sent you guys a letter about earlier in the year, is the challenge of, there's really in our district a lot of ignorance about diversity. And I don't just mean, I know last year there was the whole program about uh, talking about people of color and people whose family dynamics don't necessarily fit whatever standard we're supposed to have. Um, but I sent you guys a copy of the letter that I sent to my daughter's teachers about the upcoming Jewish holidays that happened in September. Jay was great about, and I do appreciate that Jay, about calling me to follow up and talk more about that. 
even with that, and I didn't end up calling Jay back to follow up because I just have been so beyond upset about the way things happen, but one of my kids came home on Yom Kippur after I sent that letter, after I talked to Jay, after all of that work, with four hours of homework, four hours of homework on Yom Kippur, which I had specifically said she wouldn't be able to do any work during that time. And she cares so much about being successful at school and is so focused on it that while she fasted, she left synagogue early to come home and spend four hours working on her homework so she wouldn't be behind at school. And you know, that's, there's something wrong with a kid feeling like she's gonna be in trouble for observing her religious heritage. And, and I recognize there's not a lot of Jewish kids in the community, I know that. I know there's not a lot of Muslim kids in the community, but I also know they have a hard time at their holidays as well. I know other people do. Um, one thing I mentioned to Mr. Sullivan is maybe we need to do a type of forum where we bring in families who don't fit the white Christian model and talk about how that impacts us, whether it's kids speaking or whether it's adults speaking, to educate the teachers on what that impact really is on families, because it's been very hard. You know, eight years, I've sent the same letter to teachers, eight years, nine years, including kindergarten, and nine years continue to have events get scheduled on those days. It's really, really hard, really hard to justify to my kids why they're having so many pressures. Um, my final thing is a recommendation. Yesterday it was great that the high school was closed. We had um, record-breaking turnout at the polls yesterday. Um, according to my husband, we had 50% more voters yesterday than in any other midterm election, um, which is pretty incredible. I would say that one idea that I want to pitch to you guys for the next major election in two years is rather than closing all the districts, uh, schools in the district, is just to close the high school. But to take the freshmen and have them do some kind of service palooza day like they do at the middle school and take the sophomores and juniors out and do college tours with them and take the seniors maybe over to UNH and do a whole fair day about how to pay for college or how what other options there are besides college if they're not in you know, college-bound kids, so that it's still being used as an academic day, gets them out of the building so that the town can continue to use it for the, well, we had 6,700 voters, I believe, yesterday, um, to keep everybody safe, but as a way to have them continue to have an academic day that day. So, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Hey, could I have a, a motion to approve the October 24th, 2018 regular meeting minutes? Denise? I'll make a motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes. Moved by Denise. Is there a second? Brian? Are there, are there changes? Hearing none, uh, we're to vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor, the minutes are approved. Um, so now I think we have the spot, spot for Ron, so if you'd like to come up and... Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Ron Lamar from La Valley Brinsinger Architects, and since we met last, um, the school board has gone out and gotten a geotechnical engineer to go to the existing site and uh, dig some test pits. Um, we've also flagged all of the wetlands on the property and confirmed. So in their packets, they have John Turner's memo. Okay. But we haven't read it yet. Um, but we haven't read it, so. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, the gist of the memo um, was to put this together some information so that we as the architectural team, Bowen Corporation as the contractor, and our structural engineer, as well as John Turner Consulting, um, could really come back and address the issues that were raised at the last meeting, which was there were some issues with an addition and renovation project back in the 90s. Is this site actually buildable? Um, so the short answer is yes and then we can talk about some details if you like. Um, just a couple big picture things. The one thing you got going for you with this project, which obviously was different from the 90s, is this is a standalone new building, what we're talking about. So you're not tied into any floor levels, uh, if you will. You're not tied into any particular location, like how does it actually connect uh, to the building. So because of that, and because obviously you can see in the memo that there is ledge on the site, as someone um, pointed out. We have the opportunity to do foundations completely differently as a standalone building. Um, we can take advantage of the ledge by sitting the building on top of the ledge and bringing some dirt up, if you will, as opposed to drilling down and digging out the ledge. Um, so there's lots of different opportunities that we have. The great news is there's ledge. 
which means your geothermal system um, is going to be far more efficient. So if you had less ledge on a site, for instance, you'd have to drill more wells to get the certain amount of bore length um, that you need for heating and cooling in a facility. We haven't done exhaustive explorations yet um, in terms of how dense the rock is um, or where the building would actually go on the site because we wanted to get back to you with the information of is there anything about the site that would scare us into saying that really it's not a buildable site? I'll give you an example of that. We've had sites before where there's a lot of clay. Um, clay can absorb moisture and at times of the year it gets very dense, it gets very soupy. Um, that's a scary proposition. Um, so most times that becomes an expensive site um, aside from geo piers or other things. So. I think what John Turner's report shows and what we've been able to do, meaning with Ali Brenzinger, our structural engineer, and um, Bowen Corporation, was to look at this and say there's nothing that would lead us to say that this is not a buildable site. So questions about, well that was the question we posed. So we have questions for, for Ron? So just, just in terms of process, once you say this is where we're going to, this is the footprint of the building that we anticipate building, I anticipate then there's much more densely, you know, located borings to make sure that on that particular footprint things are workable. Is that the way it, it goes? Correct. So what we would do is, as we started our visioning sessions, the visioning sessions are really for us to listen to the community. It's not for us to talk about our ideas or what we think. We'd like to know what you think. Um, so as we continue those, we're gonna get to a point where we are gonna start talking about how would the building fit on to the site? Um, where are those limits in terms of the wetland? Where is the property line? How far away from the existing school do we need to stay so that you can actually occupy and operate the school uh, during construction? And so at that point, we would start you know, basically generating some kind of footprint or some kind of layout of what we would consider the buildable area. You know, like we're gonna stay within these limits right here. Um, and then to your point, what we would do in cooperation with, as we're designing the footprint of the building, come in and drill some deep borings. Um, those deep borings would tell us exactly what we're, what we're looking at. They would also tell us um, the density of the rock which would then determine how do we actually sit on that rock? Um, how do we connect to it? How do we you know, address that? The other thing that we would do is drill a test well. And Jim was able to, get, um, in his maintenance records, he, you actually have an 800, like 825 foot well on the site right now that you use for lawn irrigation. Um, so we've actually reached out to the geothermal engineer just this afternoon to say is there any way you know, we could use that well, if you will, to get information on the, on the ground, on the earth. In other words, what is that heat transference that's gonna happen if we were to put a well in there? Um, if they can do that, then we would come out and check that out. If they couldn't do that, then we would come in and actually drill a well um, <clears throat> and put in, you know, the pipes that you would see in a, in a geothermal well, and we would do some testing. And that would give us the heating and cooling capacity of the rock itself. Um, all rock is different. <laughs> so you can get some solid rock, you can get rock that have fissures through it with groundwater. And remember, we're not touching the groundwater, um, but as that rock gets looser, the conductivity, I believe is the word, of the heat and cooling loss is different from well to well. So we would want to get that information because we also want to locate a well field um, as part of the project. Thanks. Brian? Does the amount of ledge, does it make a big difference in the cost of the building? Or is it, I mean, I know it has pluses and minuses, but does it make a mm -hmm. big difference depending on how much ledge you find? Well, the there? good news is, as you can see in the report, um, there's not a lot of outcroppings, right? So you're going down two feet just to begin with. So the goal here is to take out as little as possible. For instance, if we end up, if there's a big flat area where we're gonna put the footprint of the school, then that whole school would sit on top of the ledge and we'd build a grade up around it. And when the old school comes down, if you look at the road that accesses right in front of the main entrance, it's high up 
and then your road act, your land actually slopes down to the back parking lot in the field. And what we're thinking is, well, if we go up over here, then really it's the same elevation from here to here. So the idea is to limit the amount of rock uh, that needs to come out. So, and that was the contractor's feeling as well. You know, why, why drill through rock if you don't have to? If it were an addition to renovation project and you were trying to make the first floors line up right. or the second floors line up, you really have no choice, right? You have to figure something out there where it just becomes very difficult. And, you know, so lots of times the answer is you gotta <coughs> dig out the rock or move the addition further away <laughs> from the building with the ramps. <laughs> Ron, can you tell us the next step, the next steps in terms of what you're gonna be doing in the immediate future? Yeah, um, so we had two great visioning sessions and thank you for everybody who could attend. Um, we gained lots of information from everybody from the students uh, to the selectmen from the towns. So, and everybody in between, obviously the educators and we had parents there. Um, what we've done in terms of listening is sort of written down what everybody said, which is significant about the school and I think we went through this uh, last time. Now what we need to do is bring those findings back to a small focus group made up of representatives of all of those different groups that we had met with over the two days to determine did we listen, you know, did we hear what you wanted us to hear? You know, sometimes somebody says tomato or tomato <laughs> and we're writing it down. We want to make sure that it's, it's a tomato, it's a tomato. And so we're going to present that to everybody in a few hours of a workshop. The next few hours will be now that we're confident <clears throat> that we've listened and we've got everybody's thoughts on paper, we're gonna ask to answer several questions. And we've submitted those questions uh, back when we did the first workshops. And those questions have to do with really, what is Oyster River Middle School gonna be? You know, how are you gonna address um, the educational future of technology? How are you gonna be able to address uh, the future of curriculum? How are you gonna be able to address the uh, social, emotional learning aspects into the future? And so those, questions are really important because once we design this school, we want to do it so that it's adaptable and flexible into the future. And we don't want to dictate like what you should be doing. <clears throat> we'll tell you if you're going down the wrong road, <laughs> you know, with bars and prisons and things like that. But um, I, I think what we really want to be able to say is, for one thing, we learned that there's an incredible music program here, right? right. So your school right off the bat, if you were to say to me, okay, start, I would think, well, the big theme is gonna be music, but there may actually be a lot more to that and a lot more in terms of the underlying um, parts and pieces of how this whole thing goes together. And that's what the next big workshop is about. Once that happens, we're gonna to put together a document uh, for you all to see what we did, how we did it, the information we gathered and the conclusions we came to. And the conclusions are really how do those questions get answered? And that's the second part of the workshop is to go over those questions with everybody talk about the concept of answering those questions, like what do people really think? And then we put together what I'm talking about is this draft piece that says this is now the vision. So this is what Oyster River Middle School is really gonna be like in the future. That's when we sit down with all of the focus group of educators and students to really talk about what is fifth grade, what is sixth grade, how does the environment start to organize itself um, around all the pieces with that vision in mind. So Ron, I just wanna share with the board uh, that report back to the visioning group is November 19th from uh, 6 to 8 p.m. And then once Ron has done that piece, we'll bring him back and share those results to the school board on December 5th. And we can go to that meeting on the 18th. And you're more than welcome to go to the 19th. meeting on the 19th. Yeah. If you can attend, that would be great. Um, but you're going to get a special board report to you on the 5th. So if you can't make it, you'll get it on the 5th. Where is that meeting? Where is this going? It's going to be at the middle school in the multi-purpose room. Multi room. Just one question about, we talked a little bit today, we had a meeting earlier today, and part of the land slopes down toward the, the marsh area, mm -hmm. um, which I think in our discussions you saw that as a, as a challenge, but also pos possibly as an opportunity in terms of envisioning the school. You know, I wonder if you could say something about that aspect of the site that, you know, there is this sloping down toward right. the, uh, 
toward the marsh area. Yeah. Um, so the great thing is, is you've got this great marsh down there, and it's a wonderful little environmental or ecological educational opportunity for the students, right? So how do you get from the level of the ball field that's there now with the fence going around it, how do you get down there? And so our team was talking about possibly terracing, you know, down that hill, whether that terrace is part of the building itself or whether that terrace is outdoor space. Um, one of the things that came up during the visioning was the importance for outdoor space and be able to let the children run around, uh, allow them to have recess uh, without buses driving through and everything else. Um, and the nice thing about that is depending on how we do those terraces, how do we integrate that hill into the building? So it's number one, it's something nobody else has, right? It's very special uh, to Oyster River. And number two, it takes care of really the social and emotional needs of the students to get out, get some exercise, uh, get out onto the, into the eco ecology, I guess you would call it, of the site. Maybe the science aspect is right off of that area. Um, so you can have indoor sort of outdoor science, indoor outdoor eating. Uh, so there's really a lot of opportunity uh, for that hill. Not to say that, you know, we're just gonna completely stay away from the hill and ignore it. Uh, because it really does create a nice little bowl which is very secure, actually. So you really don't need fences for any kind of playground if you have this nice sort of um, bowl, if you will, that, that people can sort of tear us down into and feel safe and secure. I mean, I think that's one of the concerns I heard that you'd have a, the, uh, the potential to have a really large retaining wall, very high retaining wall yeah. uh, forming that, which would be kind of unsightly. Very. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but that's a great, a great thought, you know, like how do we address that hill? How do we make it part of the project? Not be scared of it, but embrace it without having to build big, tall retaining walls. Sometimes big, wall, tall retaining walls are okay. We did a nice war memorial actually on one site that had a 10 foot high retaining wall. Um, kind of killed two birds with one stone. So, but I don't see that here. I think, you know, you get a great opportunity to step down that hill into the, into the wetlands. Does that, the test pits you've already done, does, is it that test or other ones down the road that'll allow you to know if you, if that land can actually handle the weight of a large building like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll definitely be looking into that. Okay, but the test pits don't tell that. It's you, no, the, when you the do test the pits don't tell that, that right now. No. No. Okay. No. Is that a concern or is that? No, because we know there's rock there. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think what the test pits tell us is that the rock pretty much goes across and then heads downhill. The question is how far and how fast does it, does it head downhill? And how do we take advantage of that to tie in everything we're doing, you know, to the stability of the rock? Okay. So lots more to investigate, obviously. This is, you know, it's a kind of a blue sky speaking right now, right? So we've got lots of ideas, lots of things that we can do. We just gotta find the most cost effective uh, way of getting the biggest bang for your buck. Other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. All right, thank you. Okay, um, announcements, accommodations, comments from the district. Jay Richard, principal of the middle school. I just wanted to briefly talk about, uh, we did our first time ever student-led conferences yesterday from about 7.30 in the morning till 7.30 at night. As Dr. Morris, I was so enthused how well it went due to the work of our uh, staff and students. Um, numerous positive compliments from parents throughout the day. Um, no parking tickets issued, uh, they can pass open houses. <laughs> but I just wanted to share with the board how, you know, how well it went, particularly for a first time we've done something like this. And we will be reaching out to parents uh, shortly to get feedback in terms of what went really well and what did they like and also ways we could improve that experience for everyone. Thank you. Good evening. I just wanted to speak a little bit about our teacher workshop yesterday. We had a wonderful day. It was a faculty-led day for faculty. Um, and I just want to thank John Bromley and Nick Ricciardi for leading that day. We have some exciting things happening with collaboration and teacher teaming um, going on that will continue throughout the school year. Um, and that's 
teacher-led, um, and we also had some SEL activities led by John, um, Nick Ricciardi in the Exercise Physiology and Wellness Department with faculty, and it was great to see them building towers with um, pasta, tape, and marshmallows, um, and doing some really fun activities together and bonding as a faculty. Thank you. Announcements, are there more from the district? No. Um, from the board? No. So I just wanted to follow up as well uh, and thank the school district for all they did uh, in terms of the election yesterday. I mean, I know that we talked about alternative sites and people talked about, I've heard talk about why don't we have a polling place on UNH's campus, but what people forget is that democracy runs on volunteerism. And yesterday was extraordinary. Uh, there was over 1,650 same-day registrations occurring. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody register a young college student coming in, which there were droves of, but it was machine-like. And I was sitting at a table with another, uh, with a resident advisor from UNH, and for four hours we were cranking out two at a time. Uh, and it, it's just an extraordinary uh, process. I cannot see how we would have done it in another location. Um, so it's, it's a great opportunity or a great thing that the, the uh, district did for us, so thank you. Thanks, so. and, and if I could follow up on that. Um, I was um, lucky enough to be a volunteer in the evening hours, um, maybe coming to 5.30 and probably left the school after 10. And there's a real big infrastructure that is put up for the election. And as we were there, you know, polls had closed two and a half hours ago and we're reconciling the vote. Our custodial staff is repurposing that room to a gym. And, um, and I just hope that maybe formally we could um, extend a thank you as they were taking the uh, blue um, padding off of the floor. Um, then there, there's all the boating kind of loose and they're just working there taking that down and um, it, it was a great effort for all the people who volunteered but also what the school provided as well. Are you, are you suggesting that I formally acknowledge the custodial staff? I think Ken? they were just, I it's a, a whole extra job that yeah. they had. Be glad and, you do that. And they did a, it great, so. Um, Brian Cisneros, myself, Jim, and Jim Rizicki visited uh, Keene Middle School, <coughs> which is a new middle school, and uh, we visited the middle school section of Bedford, so we took a day trip, and it was really interesting to see, particularly at Keene, so many of the elements we've been talking about, multiple spaces, really kind of expertly designed team areas, uh, having like the library be central, um, the music space, uh, having little nooks where you might have two students kind of just meet, uh, and all, all in this really open um, space. I mean, it's really interesting to see that. Um, Bedford, I think, had some limitations because they were building a middle school and a high school together, so c combining those two on a fairly small property, you know, they couldn't do quite as much as Keen could do in my, in my view, but, but still wonderful teaching spaces, you know, bigger, big classrooms. Um, so it was, I, I don't know, Brian, you, what your reaction was, but I thought it was really interesting just to see these possibilities and, and maybe if any of you wanna, you know, join, join the field trip at some point, it's really interesting. Well, it was good because the new schools, as you would, uh, they're not institutional, like very, like they don't have corridors, they're much more open spaces. Um, every nook and cranny was used effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, most important was the storage. Mm -hmm. We have, the, for example, um, they have a beautiful auditorium in Keene that seats about almost a thousand. Um, looks almost like ours, but just newer. But the difference being is underneath all those steps, like the stairs, um, seats, I'm sorry, that we all have is a huge storage room and every department has their own area of storage. And it was just, they said that was a lifesaver because you know, science has their area, you know, uh, physical education has their area, you know, there's props for the plays, there's, you, you know, it was just, every square inch felt like it was effectively used. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and it was that was pretty cool. Yeah. I thought because it was so much wasted space and and your schools you see now they're just square and everything and this was actually mm -hmm. very um, efficiently used. Mm -hmm. And to a point that Patty's made a number of times, just the sunlight, the light that came in from right. you know from above, you know, in the library and other places, it's just really well lit by natural light. So, real interesting possibility. I, and I remember, I think both of you. Did you go up to Hanover last year and, yeah, and yeah. looked at schools? And um, it's very exciting. And I wonder, I don't know if it's meaningful, but it's an issue to get the public to approve building a new school. Mm -hmm. And maybe in these communities, too, another piece of the road trip is kind of learning their process on how they were able to um, develop that community support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and what that endeavor went, and maybe that would help us with our process as well. Mm -hmm. so, that yeah. was part of the conversation. We, we talked yeah, talk about that sound, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. great. That's actually er, early in the conversation, that was the part we great. discussed. Thank yeah, you. I think, I think, I think in Keene, they got eight, a vote of 80%. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, talk about building support for it. Because I think the other, the, the, the other building was condemned or something. So, I mean, there's, there's some, some kind of incentive. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. That's oh, great. Real pleasure. So I think we want to make, we've asked Ron for some suggestions of buildings that he's worked on, and so, so we're, I think we're going to keep, keep So we, as we set up other field trips, we can let board members know, and if it's something that you can fit into your schedule, you're welcome to join and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And Aramark paid for lunch, so, so we're good. Wow. Um, other comments? Okay, um, Assistant Superintendent report, no? Okay. So Jim? Yep. Um, just a few. Um, I did want to point out that uh, in a surprise, uh, we had put in uh, um, for grant money for Moharamit, and uh, once they went through the first round, there was very little money left, and we thought we wouldn't get any money for Moharamit. Uh, turns out that they had $2 million left, and they decided to give all the schools who didn't get anything from the first round $100,000. So as we consider tomorrow uh, the budget this hundred thousand dollars is actually um, approved and can be used against the Mohara project so yes. I wanted to share that with the board can I ask a quick question about that sure so the letter says that the award must be claimed by April 1st of next mm -hmm. year what does that mean? And is there a is there a restriction on when the project needs to be completed? No. Um, well, there is a restriction when it can be completed, Michael. But um, Sue actually followed through on that because she had the same immediate concern you did, and it's an, an issue of commitment. And um, so, you just put in for an extension. Yeah. Thanks, Sue. So that's really great news. Um, Denise asked uh, me if I would chase after some comparables. Uh, Ron sent us a bunch of, of comparables in terms of the cost of various schools, and in, in that memo is in your packet. Um, I also, at the bottom, added the cost of uh, Dover High School and the renovation in addition to New Market to kind of give you a reference point. So. Um, I think that was just there uh, is a matter of touching base. Does 45, uh, 46 million dollars sound like the right price? And if you look down through that list, it it does feel like it's an appropriate cost for a brand new middle school for 120,000 square feet. So that that's in your packet. That's a follow through for for um, the question that Denise asked. You also have a letter in your packet from Chief Kurz uh, related to traffic safety and the traffic safety committee that he is on um, took a position against um, the Goss property. They had concerns about a host of issues that are in that memo, so that, that is there for your review. And we've moved the dedication of Mastway from next week to December 5th. Um, we had a meeting yesterday, and if we have the meeting next week, 
then uh, the classrooms, though the classrooms would be finished, the front entrance wouldn't be. But more importantly, Carrie felt that when you came, you should see the classrooms decked out as classrooms, not just empty shells or halls of classrooms. So we moved it to the fifth. Um, we are, we are, are inviting the select people from um, Lee, of course. But then I had an inquiry from our local state uh, delegation about whether they could attend, and so we're going to invite the representatives and the state senator who support um, our region. We also are inviting the commissioner and the governor. Um, this money, this front entrance money of $560,000 was really um, unusual. Uh, for Oyster River to receive. And when the governor and commissioner decided to put safety dollars forward, they did it uh, in a way that allowed us to compete uh, for the grant money. And so uh, when we do this dedication, they've been invited. I also would share with you that if should the governor not be able to attend, you know, a December meeting, I, I certainly would um, adjust to his schedule and at least show him the product of his good work in terms of putting the safety dollars forward. So, you know, we, this the fifth will be, um, I think it's a big deal for the town of Lee and for the district. We know that it's a relatively modest um, overall upgrade to the facility, but it just makes the building so much more safer and far more flexible for district use as we move into the future. And um, I wanted to, quite frankly, highlight the, the good work that that we've done and and uh, the efforts the state went through in, in, in making sure that um, districts even like Oyster River, who generally don't qualify for state funds over and above, uh, put it to good use. So uh, December 5th is the day and we'll have a whole bunch of people there besides ourselves and we'll try to make it a event. Okay. So does that mean next week we'll be here? Next week we'll be here. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Great. Yes, Denise. Um, just to thank you for those comparison schools. I just think that's um, useful information moving forward. And when the com com uh, community says, you know, well, what about this much money? And I just think it's really helpful. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, Mrs. Administrator, Sue. Uh, first thing I just wanted to see if there's any questions on the status of the current year budget. I did notice that the titles are all off. They say 1718, it is 1819's okay. budget, and they are the right totals. Okay. Um, this is the first pass where we've encumbered all of our staff. Um, it does not include um, athletics and co-curricular. We did that this week, and it also flushes out anything that doesn't look right, which as you can see, um, retirement was um, over budgeted, and that doesn't make sense. We've since fixed that. And if I compare this to last year, it's right in line with where we were at the same time last year. Okay. Questions? Okay, and then the other thing I have is the tuition rate. The standard calculation we do every year, um, this is to provide it to the town for the UNH Forest Park students, and then it's for, uh, I think we have just one student that a staff member um, request attend here that we charge um, a third to, and if anyone else um, attends Oyster River outside of a tuition agreement, that's the rate we use. Um, I use the standard formula. Do you need an approval of this rate? Or yes, I do need your approval for this. Yeah. We have a motion to approve these rates. So I would move that we accept as the rates for tuition students, um, elementary school $18,916, middle school $17,732, and high school $18,394. Moved by Kenny, is there a second? Second by Michael. Um, questions for her? Yes, I have. Yeah. The, the only question I had was the, um, was it the elementary costing more than the high school, <laughs> which seemed odd to me? Um, enrollment, it's, a, it's a, a result of enrollment. I mean, if you look at um, the numbers at the elementaries, they've gone down, and I do, I do look at that and wonder what's going on there, and that's, that's what it is, it's the enrollment figure we use. So with those small kindergarten classes, right? Yep, okay, yeah. Yep. Okay, yep. Yeah. The only thing I would add is UNH is decommissioning Forest Park. Yeah, they still wanted it this year, though. I know. So it's like, so. I think it's June of next year. Yeah. Like so that, so mm -hmm. that will no longer exist. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So I think we have a motion and a second, right, on this? Mm -hmm. I'll read a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor. Thank you. Those rates are approved. Thank you. Student center report? Yeah. Okay. Um, so tonight was the World Language Festival. The French and Spanish classes, levels three and up, all presented their plays. I just did mine right before coming here. It was a lot of fun. It's always one of my favorite nights of the year. There's lots of food, um, culturally um, appropriate food. Kids make Spanish and French food to bring, um, to get points on their midterms. <laughs> I, made, I wrote the program for my play to get a point. Um, and Monday was winter sports. Uh, meeting night, um, so, you know, basketball, ski, hockey, swimming, indoor track, I think that's all. Um, everyone met in the auditorium as a large group and then split off to um, listen to their coaches talk and have individual uh, group meetings, I should say. Um, the fall play is going on next week, the night of the 15th, 16th, and 17th at 7 every night. I think that's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I believe. Um, that's really exciting. It's going to be really good. Um, college applications, I mentioned last time, the November 1 deadline has passed. So some people are able to sort of sit back on their heels for a couple weeks before applying to scholarships. Um, but people who are applying to November 15th deadlines are still working hard, editing essays and getting their FAFSA done and all. Um, more exciting news is that Coffee House is this Thursday, the quarterly uh, event. Uh, it's at 5.45, I believe, $5 for admission and then food and music once you get in. I highly recommend it, it's a lot of fun. Um, and as I mentioned last time, quarter one was about to end, it has now ended. Um, there's always a flurry of activity right before the end of the quarter, so it's nice to have that over as well. Uh, yeah, it's been busy around here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions for her? Okay, um, so we're ready for the uh, presentation on one-to-one. -one. Jay Richard, principal again at the middle school. Um, I had Jordan Zercher, she works for the Mother River, come down and uh, meet with me today to ask questions about the one-to-one -one rollout. And one of the questions was, you know, Mr. Richard, do you have any regrets? And I, they said, I do have one. I wish I thought of doing this several years ago. <laughs> um, I have my two superstars here in terms of why this rollout went exceptionally well. The word I like to use that they probably get sick of is seamless. Uh, I don't see how it really have, it could have gone any better than it did, and it's you know a, a great um, reflection of the kind of work uh, Nick Bellows, my school librarian, and uh, Nico Vines, my tech integrated, do. And I'll turn it right over to them. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. <coughs> Um, first, I uh, just want to thank you for the opportunity to give you this update. It's, it's been an exciting first quarter of the school year and um, the addition to the devices has just made a huge uh, impact, I think, on all of our lives in the school, particularly the kids. Um, so I, I just want to talk about the initial getting the devices into the kids' hands and we did that over the first three days of school. We got uh, almost 700 devices out uh, across all four grade levels. Um, the process was uh, pretty standardized across all three grade levels, sorry, four. Um, eighth graders came in on the first day and um, Nico delivered uh, a presentation that talked with them about uh, responsible use and how to care for the devices and what this was gonna mean for them on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the kids proceeded to come over and they would get their device and their bag and we used the library catalog system to keep track of the inventory. So it's really easy for us to be able to tell who has what device and uh, that also helps us when we need to maybe uh, loan a kid a device when we're doing some troubleshooting. Uh, I wanna make sure I didn't miss any of the major stuff here. Uh, um, also the last part of that process as far as getting kids to the devices was um, we created a uh, 
a form for the kids to bring home and have a conversation with their families about what this device <coughs> means to them and how they need to take care of it and uh, what responsible use looks like. And once the kids returned those forms, they were able to take the devices home. And we get those forms back pretty quickly. Uh, I think the kids wanted to be able to take those devices home. So uh, it, it went really well. Again, um, you know, in three days to get almost 700 devices out. Um, I'm not sure if we could have done uh, anything to make that happen faster or smoother. It, it, w it went really well. Nico's going to talk more about what's happening with the devices now that we have them. So I'll turn it over to her. Hey there. Huh? So how it's going, um, honestly, our students have been incredibly responsible with these devices so far. Um, we have very few students that come in having forgotten them at home. I mean, think, I mean, thinking about the fact that there's 675 going home every day, um, we only about disperse about like one or two loaners a day for students that forgot them at home, so that's less than 1%, so it's pretty incredible. Even the fifth graders, honestly, they're the, they're the strongest showing of students that remember them every day. Um, we haven't had a lot in the way of damage. When you have 700 devices, you're bound to have a few defects, so we did have some factory things that had to go back and they Dell replaced them, but um, We've only had five devices damaged out of 700 so far after quarter one, so again, less than 1%, and they were really, truly accidents. Um, and I think that that's bound to happen as well when you have a new system in place. Um, also, we do have to give a lot of credit to Josh and his team. I mean, when you guys voted this a yes on this, the amount of work that they had to do up until this point to get them um, you know, unboxed and ready to go and then stacked in my office and then um, dispersed. They were a huge part of why the rollout went so smoothly and we could do that in three days. We have implemented protocols if a student forgets a device at home or um, if for some reason it's damaged and they need to receive a loaner. The majority of students we find are charging them overnight at home, um, but we are allowing the students to choose to keep them at school um, and there are designated places in their classroom for them to charge if that's the case. Uh, and teachers have come up with a lot of team strategies to communicate with students about the devices. Um, we've had a couple whole team meetings if there's an issue, but also just something as simple as signage outside of each of their doors to allow the students to simply see while they walk by, do I need my device for class today? If not, leave it in your locker. Um, if you need it for your next class and you won't have time to get to your locker, put it under your seat or somewhere safe in the, in the classroom, um, but just some quick visuals so a student knows and they're not wondering if they need it for the class that day. Um, and we have a new student tech team, it's the first at ORMS. Um, we had an application process. We had many students, 25 students apply, which seems low, but I was really excited about it. Um, and we ended up selecting 12 students who are going to start getting um, trained and start uh, helping out with some initiatives, school-wide initiatives, the first being some PSAs about proper device usage um, in some fun ways, and um, also our hour of code that's coming up. So that's some of the exciting stuff. As far as um, PD with staff, uh, we have a building level staff technology committee, some of who um, presented here last year. Um, we have reps from every grade level and specialty, as well as special ed. Um, we have created goals for this year at the building level. Goal number one was to plan and provide continuous PD in a variety of formats. Um, goal two was to do a 360 survey of staff, students, and parents by April um, to see how things are going and what we need to improve on and what things they really love about this initiative. And then goal number three was to research and suggest revisions to some of the current technology policies to fit the new one-to-one -one structure. Um, maybe just looking around at other schools that are one-to-one -one and see how the, some of their policies are phrased, um, especially in the way of responsible use versus acceptable use. Um, every teacher workshop day, with the exception of yesterday, uh, includes a tech hour. So we provide multiple different tools that teachers can come learn about. They get to choose which session they attend, but they're all pretty much expected to attend a session. Um, and the last one we did was really successful. And um, in October, we launched the ORMS pineapple chart. We kind of alluded to that last year when we threw out our pitch. Um, basically, teachers sign up when they're using a really creative or doing a really creative project in the classroom and they want to open their doors and say aloha to their fellow teachers to just come in and you know, grab a snack in the back or prep in the back of the classroom and be a passive observer of the things that are actually actively going on in the classroom. Because I can stand in front of 60 teachers and tell them that a tool is really cool and they're really going to engage their students, but until they see their students using it um, and what how they use it and how they expand upon it, um, it's actually truly a much bigger 
form of PD. Um, and it's lent to actually teachers signing up for things that don't even include tech. So the art teacher invited teachers into her room to see the, some of the projects they were working on and it's kind of opened a sense of uh, collegiality about teachers feeling like they can just walk through each other's classes. When the pineapple lights are on, you're welcome in, aloha. So. Um, we also are using a little bit of time during future curriculum meetings for subject-specific technology discussions and sharing across um, subject-specific teachers from uh, fifth to eighth grade. So, any questions? Just before you get questions, I just want to remind the board that at the next meeting, Nico and uh, Sue Leifer and Sarah and Celeste will be doing another version of this, but in terms of how the technology is influencing our curriculum and our pedagogy in the classrooms. So tonight was steering away from that so Nico didn't have to repeat herself next week. Question. Um, I know even before Jay's email came out the other day, I mean, there's been issues with kids finding ways to play games and everything on the computers and accessing other ways through other portals or what have you. Has there been any headway on trying to yep. get so control of that? Yep, so as soon as a parent or anyone brings something like that to our attention, so for example, the, the Candy Crush thing happened at the beginning of the year where they were finding a way to download that from the Microsoft Store. Josh and his guys were super responsive about that and shut that down within two days. So as the kids kind of flex their muscles and kind of find ways to do things, our tech team, our IT department is really on top of it. Um, as soon as it's brought to our attention, we address it. Um, and they've already found a solution for some Chrome extension stuff that we're going to start implementing on Friday. So I'm testing out. What about when they're in the classroom and they're not, I mean, are they, they're being monitored from the teacher? Oh, yeah. Where the they teachers. know if they're, I mean, I know we talked about a program where the teacher's looking at it and if they're off where they're supposed to be, it'll go to the top and they'll. Yeah, um, we do have a filtering system. Our teachers haven't been trained on that yet, but our teachers are really good about using like kind of their eyeballs and making sure they're circulating the classroom. I mean, when they're using the technology, they're engaging with the lesson and with each other. So the teachers are aware of what's going on when they're in the classroom. I'm pretty confident. I mean, do you? Yeah, I mean, we have a smart kids, so they're going to try to find ways, things that they can do. Keep in mind, like, the Chrome extension games they're playing, it's like, you know, Donkey Kong and uh, things like that. But again, that's something we're going to fix. Uh, one of the cool things for me as principal, when I walk around the school, teachers have even um, modified their classrooms in terms of when they're using technology. So, for example, they'll create, like, a big U, so, like, the teacher's in the middle, so they can scan around quickly and look around and see what every student's doing on their laptop. Uh, and also, again, it's classroom management. If a student's playing a game, you know, when they're supposed to be doing something else, that's inappropriate. Uh, they shouldn't be doing that, even as well as home. If a kid's using their laptop that's district provided to play a game, uh, Nico, as she said, in the first few days of school, they told the kids, you're not supposed to be doing that. It's for learning purposes only, so. Can I have just one more thing about that? <clears throat> I think also it's, uh, it's worth um, keeping in mind that we're at the very early stages of kind of reestablishing the culture in our school and in our relationship to um, how the kids and how our teachers leverage these devices. So that process is still in the early stages, but I, I feel like it's going really well considering we've had about two and a half months. Um, uh, a lot of that also has to do with the kids understanding responsible use and that uh, is what Nico was alluding to earlier when we want to talk about um, looking at responsible uh, responsible use policies as opposed to acceptable use policies which put a little bit more of uh, put a little bit more on the students to think about what they're doing it's not so much about consequences as about this is the right way to, to think about using technology. It's uh, a responsible use policy is less about the district's responsibility and more about the student's responsibility when it comes to using those devices. And, that, and that's part of a, a culture shift that comes about because we've introduced these devices uh, into our community. So I, I think it'll happen. It's just gonna take a little bit of time to happen. Have any um, parents opted out of the program? Uh, no parents have opted out. Every kid's got a laptop. So what we went to, where's it, Lebanon, where they only 
Uh, we were up in Hanover, uh, a couple of parents had decided to opt out from right. their one-to-one -one program, but we have not had that at all at our middle but school. But they do have the option if they want. Oh, yeah. yeah. If a parent, also, if a parent said, listen, Jay, I don't want my student bringing this laptop home at night because it's a constant struggle because they're trying to play Donkey Kong. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, those are challenges. I mean, kids like video games, and, you know, every parent knows it might not be the laptop, it might be Xbox 360 or something else, or their cell phone, where you have to you know, create those parameters. But if again, a parent said, Jay, I don't want my kid bring the laptop home, no problem. They can keep it right at school and we'll charge it every night for them. Okay. Yes, the, do the, um, are they submitting homework online? I mean, through the laptop? Or are they yep. when they're home? Really? Yep. Denise? Um, we also had another uh, comment, um, a letter that was submitted to us from a parent concerned about the keyboarding skills. And I was just mm -hmm. curious about you know, that we do, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I know we do do keyboarding in third grade okay. and we do some keyboarding, uh, Nico does through a 21st century life skills program. We also have programs that are open for any parent or child to use outside of the classroom as well if they wanted to do it at home. That was one of my favorite parts of third grade. <laughs> they have these things, covers that you can put over the keyboard so you can't see any of the letters and you have to try and type without looking at the letters. It's fun. <laughs> uh, Denise, I often joke too, they've heard me say this, but if you have uh, very awful keyboarding skills, there is a career for you, you can become a middle school principal. <laughs> uh, when people see me keyboard, it's, it's something else. Uh, yeah, Kerry, um, uh, thank you for this and um, I, you know, and I, I think we made the right decision as a board and this decision really came out of the cell phone mm -hmm. discussion. And, I, and if, if it's not, you know, if you're not ready to answer, I was just curious about a few things. One, um, some parents were concerned about communication. Were they able to yep. um, get messages to their kids? Does that seem to be going okay? Very, very well. Uh, the phones are busy, you know, in the office, particularly after school when seventh and eighth graders are trying to make new plans to do things. Uh, but it's been great, uh, you know, the bell to bell band. I think I've had two cell phones in my office. Uh, one was actually today, and there was one early in the year where. Um, you know, a student that I have a lot of respect for just went to her locker and forgot. Mm -hmm. So again, two instances, that's it, it's been great. And, and maybe an extension of that. Um, and so it came about because of concern about what was going on with the school with cell phone. Mm -hmm. Do you, s in, you in, in your wanderings about and going to the lunchroom and whatever, do you see difference? Do you see that kids are no longer walking around with phones, eating lunch with phones? The lunchroom's a lot louder, <laughs> I would say that. Which is a good So, thing. yeah, it is, it is, I mean, the lunchroom was loud before, but I, I don't think removing cell phones from the school has been a bad thing at all. Uh, kids can still communicate with their parents, and I can't emphasize enough how thrilled I am about, you know, having this one-to-one -one in my school. It really, it's, it's very exciting. It's been very positive. The kids are very enthused about it. You see them walking around with their laptops coming in through the front doors and in the hallways. It's, it's been such a pos it's had such a positive impact on our school. And another thing is, is from this interview today with the mouth of the river is, now the bottom line is my teachers can use technology whenever they choose to use it. They don't, they don't have to use it for their lessons. So we have st still have kids writing and reading writing journals, you know, but now teachers can use it whenever they want to use it. And the amount of planning time that centered around teachers trying to figure out when they had the laptops available, that's been, that's gone. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm thrilled, I really am. Great. I just want to speak okay. a comment. And, uh, one thing that really impressed me was, and a concern I had when we made the vote last spring is how little lead time we were giving you folks to do a major shift in your school. Um, but I think, I think I speak for, well, I'll speak for myself, but I think the general sense that, that 
that presentation that you folks made gave us real confidence. Hmm. You know, we hear a lot of presentations, but I think that was one of the most convincing ones we've he we've heard, at least certainly I've heard. And then your ability to be flexible and, and innovative and to, ta to, to make it work in such a short period of time, hmm. I think speaks to just the, the kind of um, innovative spirit of the middle school and the flexibility and you know kind of willingness to take that on. I think that was just great. I, I appreciate the compliment, but I was very confident when you decided that last year that this would work and it would work very well. And I mean, there's two great examples right here that I knew that you know, they're forward thinking people. They would get this right in terms of the deployment and my staff was ready. So, thanks, Tom. Well, I, was just, I had a comment from a parent. Um, oftentimes when you think of Oyster River, it's a relatively wealthy district and you think that it's no big deal for parents to buy a computer, even if they have three kids and they have to buy three mm -hmm. computers, because the computer use really is pretty significant now, particularly for homework uh, that I've seen moving from middle school to high school, and so they were like, this has been a real good thing for them because it's given them access to, to technology. And the other comment I have, uh, of course, is what did you learn from this? But what I think was a really wise decision district-wise is the technology committee really integrates all three levels in a problem-solving manner so that the lessons that are currently being learned from the middle school, which really is at the cutting edge, are disseminating to the other levels pretty mm -hmm. seamlessly so that it makes the next rollouts likely to be more successful. I think my only real concern is that right now, particularly the eighth graders, uh, they each have this laptop, they're using it, it's become a real ingrained part of their day, and they're gonna move to the ninth grade, and we're not quite ready for the implementation of the ninth grade, and we're gonna have a temporary hole that opens up, and I think that will be the real challenge for us mm -hmm. as we move forward next year. How do we adapt to that? Uh, yep when everybody's used to it. Right, I can't answer that, but I know the eighth grade students will be ready. Yeah. Um, and I have no doubt there'll be a lot of teachers at the high school sooner than later ready as well. And you know, how do you do it right? Talk to these two people, but I've already told Suzanne that uh, she can't employ them at the high school. They need to stay at the middle school. So, so Al, just so you know, that's a conversation we're having yeah, at the administrative level. Hmm. There, Anything else? Are there questions, comments? Well, thank you so Thanks. much. And thank really, you. We really appreciate the work you've done. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the decision on the middle school building site. Um, this was an issue a couple meetings ago, and we had to wait till we got the um, the results of the testing of the building site, in which we've had the report from Ron. So uh, it seems to me that we're probably at a point where if planning is to go forward, the architect needs to know where that planning, where that building is gonna be placed. Uh, and so, um, so we're gonna open up a discussion, you know, about the uh, decision to build uh, on the middle school site. Do we need a motion to go to well, discussion? Well, I think, it, you know, if somebody wants to make a motion, I think that's a good way to start. Okay. To, if making a motion on a particular site? Yeah, I think, I mean, essentially we have two choices. We could, uh, we have the, the, the Goss property site, which we, was identified as a possibility, and then we had the, uh, the current site. Those are the pretty much the two options that came out of the facilities committee, the year-long facilities committee. So I think that's pretty much the choice that's presented to us. Right, so I make a motion to uh, continue on planning on building the new middle school on the current property. Okay, moved by um, Brian, is there a second? I'll second. Second, okay. So we have it on the motion on the table, discussion. Uh, just one thing that, that didn't come out in um, <clears throat> Ron's presentation, we, we talked earlier about what happens if you do find something that costs money to, to fix in terms of excavation. And there is a contingency of three I think it's $3 million. Um, 1.8 million. 1.8 million, so, so that if something comes up, there is some money to, to take care of that. He doesn't anticipate that, and certainly that nothing of that, cal that magnitude, but there is that, so that's something that just to throw into the conversation. Um, now? So, I know, I mean, both sites reside in Durham. 
and it's like uh, one of my other gigs is sitting as a Durham town councilor. And so you, we become familiar with what is Durham's uh, strategic plan or what is our land use plan. And so uh, I think what we've gone over like educational considerations about classroom size and all that. But I think one of the important considerations to throw in is how does the school fit into the community and fit into the community's plan? And so I think it's pretty clear that the Goss site is not really consistent with what Durham's vision is in terms of our land use. And I say that because uh, the University of New Hampshire right now is working on the west edge, which is just before that property, working to try to build out a uh, university-private partnership. And so Durham has very few really developable, developable big properties left. Goss really ties into that vision of the West Edge. It gives more flexibility in terms of what you can build there, particularly if it involves something like light industry. Um, so that's the first part. When you also look at where we're looking in terms of uh, master plan, we're really looking towards more of a vibrant downtown. And by that I mean uh, we want uh, businesses down there, we want a mix of students and adults, and putting the middle school there then in proximity to the university, to the high school, to the library, and to the downtown businesses is more in line of what we're envisioning. Um, the third thing is a consideration long term about revenue that comes in to, uh, to both the towns and to the school district. Uh, when you look at the development, I think that, uh, again, uh, the technology drive area, the Goss property offers much more flexibility in terms of development. Part of your discussion is selling the current middle school for, I believe it was about $1.8 million, and trying to redevelop that, which is in actually the rural zone district of the town, will be a really challenging thing to develop. The question is, what would go in there? Uh, it would probably have to have a residential component. In theory, it may have to have then a commercial component below it, which would require likely for the town to come up with changes in zoning, which is a challenge. And I can say that because I'm one of the sponsors right now of changes in zoning occurring in the commercial district of Durham. So I think it would be very difficult to come up with something that is of a similar revenue stream than the Goss property does. The other consideration is the minute that you buy a piece of Goss that comes off the tax roll. That begins to cost both the district and the community's uh, revenue. And until such point that you can actually sell and develop the, uh, the middle school property, uh, we're at a loss in terms of revenue. So I think uh, the current site is much more in line with the thinking of where Durham is going. Not that that's the only consideration, but I think if you're going to try to build a $45 million school and you need to get uh, a lot of the community support, I think it's a challenge to get uh, get Durham support for something that really is not consistent with its, its uh, land use. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Well, not to mention if we do go with the Goss site, that's a separate, that would have to go on the ballot this coming year, correct? I think that would have to go on the ballot and have to get approved. And given the kind of a feeling, I think, in the community to have to have it on site, I think it's, it's you know, passing that could be a very, hard, very difficult exactly. thing. Exactly, and if, if we, you go and down if we that don't, and, it, and it failed, then, you know, we're back to square you're one. Because if it passes, you're still at a year, you know, you're right. a year later than you do if you're building on site. Right. But if that doesn't pass, you know, what do you do? Go back, you know, you know, you're you're really kind of pushing it down. And every year you push it That's back, good. it's it's four percent. So four percent of of uh, what forty six million is so, so something like one point eight million just for the same thing. So I just feel building off. My personal belief is I think building off site is just there's too many risks involved. Mm -hmm. too many variabilities. I'd like to stick where we are. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think it's much easier to bring, I know one of the first questions I asked was bringing the kids in as an educational experience of the whole process, mm -hmm. and I think it would be a lot easier with it being there mm -hmm. um, than being having them ship them down site. And not to mention, it's gonna be a huge difference in the, the bus routes, and, yeah. and we already have the letter in here that the traffic is probably gonna be a major issue. Mm -hmm. So that was why I'm a, um, prefer to be on the current site. Okay. 
other comments? I want to make sure we're thinking about not just this building project, but where we're going to be in 20 or 30 years. All three towns have taken a, um, a very long-term view and a very proactive view of, of land conservation. Uh, as Al said, there's not a lot of developable properties left in Durham. Um, and it's our job to think about where that leaves the school district for the long game. And we know that the current site for the middle school does not meet the current state recommendations for site size. This site for the high school, we're already talking about we don't have enough parking, we don't have, we need to build new tennis courts, fields are in use all the time. Is this site even adequate for the long run? So if we are going to say we're gonna build here, I think that what we're saying is we're going to stay on this campus forever, for our lifetimes. And how does that fit with potential growth and, and what this looks like um, you know, when all of our kids are out of school? So can I answer the growth part for Durham? So the, the identified developable uh, locations for Durham are two right now. One is a revitalization of the central business district, which is in fact why we have zoning going on to renovate the buildings that are occurring on, on Main Street. The second is Technology Drive. That really, those are really our major developable properties. The, the thought is develop where you really can to reap the revenue of it to allow us not only to have conservation lands, but to maintain our conservation lands. Because when you have, it's not enough just to have that property, you have to maintain them. And that's what our land stewardship does. So for the long game, it, it, the Goss property, we feel, is probably better suited for development, not the school. So, it, it, and by that I mean, the long game is also not just size, it's revenue to maintain your, your school system. Uh, the Goss property is a developable property other than the school, I think, probably, is a better opportunity to generate more revenue to make our school system sustainable. Kenny? Um, so, you know, Mike, I, I, I I think you make a very valid point. I think we need to make this decision thinking both of now and the future. And I think one of the things that gives me comfort in thinking that our current sites will be adequate really is the demographics. And I really, you know, we, we hear from Denise with long range um, planning, we see our numbers. I, I'm, I'm more concerned that we will be having a downsizing in how many kids are in our schools rather than an explosive growth. So I kind of feel that our size is going to be adequate. Certainly there are problems, as you note, know, with parking. But there's also the synergy that I think we would lose by moving off-site. And um, I think Al gave maybe some technical reasons, but um, the kind of synergy of someone taking math at a high school level when they're in middle school. We heard someone speak today that she would like that advanced for language arts, which to me makes a lot of sense. So there's these synergies that the two schools have together. If we separate them, we're gonna lose that. There's also the sense of a school being a community. And Goss is not a community, and it will never be a community. And there's really something special about watching those kids biking to middle school, walking to middle school, those kids leaving middle school, walking to the library, whether they're Lee or Madbury kids, and when the kids are in eighth grade, they walk downtown and they go to the candy shop or they go wherever. And that's a really vital part of a community that extends to me the school <coughs> in a very meaningful way. If we're out at a place like Goss, no matter how warm and fuzzy that school is, the school day ends and then kids are out in the middle of nowhere on a bus, there's not that connectivity of, hey, do you want to walk over to my house after school? And I think that community is so important, and I think the tie to the high school is that I'm able to overlook maybe more room at Goss to think that this is this is a special place. Um, and and Moharamid has that, and Massway is so integral to the Lee community. I think that's where schools belong or in neighborhoods, um, not not in an in industrial setting. I, I, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, I know in the past, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know in the past Oyster River has seen 
like exponential growth periods and then really steep drop-offs in numbers of students. So, I mean, what I don't know if that means anything for the future at all, but that's what the pattern has been in the past. And I also, I, as a student here, really value having the two schools next to each other. Like, um, I, my brother was at the high school when I was at the middle school, and I would walk down to, to the field and wait for him, and then he'd walk across the field and we'd walk home together. It was really nice to be connected to older kids while still being among the younger kids. And I really strongly want to emphasize what our public comment said today about accelerating th subjects other than math. Because when I was in middle school, throughout the whole process, I was bored to tears. I, it just was so aggravating. Um, and I really wish I could have had a way to excel. And having that hi the high school right next to the middle school, I think, is a great opportunity to start implementing more acceleration plans across the curriculum. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that in terms of the site, you know, in terms of looking at how the site could be reused, one of the things that makes that site look so small is the, is the just the size of the footprint of the middle school right. and the way it just eats up pretty much all that land. And when you look at how that land could be used in a more efficient way and have a smaller footprint <coughs> building uh, down towards the the right. marsh area, it just opens up a lot of space. And I remember, I remember when Steve Blatt was here, he, he showed just how that space could be used and you thought, whoa, you know, it could really be different. And so um, would it be better if it had three or four more acres? I think sure, but I think that land could be used efficiently in the talking about and it could maybe a three-story middle school, which is more efficient. Uh, and much on a much smaller footprint, that opens up a lot of land. So you don't have these three football fields of of land taken up by the building itself. Um, yeah. Um, another important issue we need to think about is, you know, the security and all. And if we ever had to evacuate either the high school or the middle school for something unprecedented. We usually send them to the other school. Let's say there's a major power failure or something and we had to take all the middle school kids. Mm -hmm. We'd probably have to march them to the high school and have them get picked up at the high school for security reasons because, or whatever. I mean, I think that's an issue that kind of has to be put into the mix as well because you won't have that luxury if you go off site. So mm -hmm. um, if something ever did happen, we can very easily go between the two schools mm -hmm. and have much more control of the flow of people and where they go. and. Uh, than we would otherwise. Mm -hmm. okay. Denise? The other thing I'm thinking of, and I don't know if this has been part of the discussion so far for the new middle school, but in terms of maybe having another turf field, which, you know, is then obviously you can get more use out of it, which we have found with the high school. And, you know, so I don't know if that. I think it is, right? Right. That's so, in the budget. yeah, it's in, the budget, it's, yeah. In the bu it's in that budget to be able to build. So one of the fields or whatever <laughs> would be a turf field. So uh -huh. um, that would address somewhat, you know, the concerns about in, which I hear, I totally understand, um, about having the um, sports area that you need. On a side note, too, fields. Another, another auditorium, which would take a little bit of the weight off of the high school auditorium yep. and use it there, yep. which could be used for multiple at the same, on the same night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Other comments? Read, read about? Okay, the motion is to, could we have the motion read again just do you have? Okay. Was it to plan the building? Um, okay. Was, to, it? was it to plan? It was to plan on the building being on the on the current site. Okay. So. Why don't we use the word select? Select. What? We select to build on the. Site. Current, site. current site. Okay. So so okay, is that? We, we select the current the site current as site. the place to no, build the. Select the current <laughs> site as the place to build. <laughs> okay. Would a discussion be without words. Okay. I think. So I think we have the, the, the motion clear now. Is there a to vote? Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Seven, six in favor, the student rep in favor. All opposed? 
when opposed, when it goes opposed, okay? So we've made that call. Um, strategic plan. Um, I just really briefly, I sent you out the, the draft of the operations plan, and I'll send you out the draft of the academic plan um, um, by the next meeting. Uh, Todd and I and Catherine and Sue Caswell have been working every spare minute to get to a place where we can get these drafts to you. The purpose of getting the drafts to you is just to give you time with them. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot to them. It wasn't designed for us to have a conversation tonight unless you want to have, you want clarification questions, but it's really to kind of give it to you. At some point, um, Tom and Denise and I will set up a time to workshop um, the strategic plan, we'll have to figure out that. I suspect it would be after the holidays. Um, so this gives you plenty of time to kind of read what's there, jot down your questions, and be ready for a workshop. This is, there's a lot there. Denise? Um, the only thing with the way this one was set out is I could only open it one page at a time. I'm, I'm not sure, it was, did you, I don't know if anybody else had that trouble, yeah. but it was just difficult. So in Michael, terms of the formatting. Yeah, Michael raised that issue. I just want to say that I deliberately did that because the document is so big that to scan through it as a whole I thought would be cumbersome. But uh, Michael, you got it as a complete document today. Did you find that easier to, I, I to use? I very much prefer it that Okay, way then altogether. I'll um, send out the complete Thank document you. all attached like I did for Michael today. And um, so the idea was and obviously my idea was not a good one since you're the second board member who's raised it, was just to make it man in manageable pieces. So I have no problem sending it out. Maybe um, when I do the academic piece, I'll send it out both ways, uh, just in case you wanna use it as kind of like chapters in the book, and then if you wanna see the whole, you can see the whole. Does that make sense? Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for the feedback. So the first year of this is the 1920 school year. Yes. How are we accommodating the proposed or the draft strategic plan in the budget when we're not gonna have the strategic plan done until after the budget needs to be done? Well, I'm assuming that the highlights of the strategic plan will rel be relatively constant. I'm not thinking you're going to get, take what I give you and turn it upside down and, and reinvent. So I'm pretty confident, for example, well, the new middle school is part of the strategic plan, of course, that's pretty easy. Um, the SEL component that you'll be getting in the academic piece is predictable because we've been working on mental health and wellness right along. The multi-tier support system um, is another part of the academic plan that we've been working on and uh, that'll be part. So I think it's pretty safe for me, Michael, to broadly address the upcoming year without um, having it finalized and blessed by the board. Because I think when you see the academic piece, you're gonna say, of course, that should be, um, you know, that should be what we should be seeing. So I don't think that, uh, unlike the first strategic plan where we were kind of pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps because we didn't have one to build off of, this plan is built off the current plan. So this logical succession to the things we've been talking about and doing uh, over these last several years that'll carry into the next several years. Right, and some things, some things are gonna impact the, the proposed budget more than others, categories that are curriculum specific may not be as impactful as things that are new programs that involve staffing or, or facilities things. Exactly, yeah. So I, I think you'll be comfortable when you see it. Um, you know, we talk, we'll talk about it a, bit, a little bit tomorrow too. Um, but there's nothing radical in terms of, there really should be no surprises for the body when they see it. I mean, everything should be making perfectly good sense based on our time together in these last years and where, do, where we're pointing ourselves into the future, so. Um, and then you had, at the la I think the last meeting, you yeah. asked the board to support you in writing a memorandum uh, uh, so that the three, 
the, the police, the three different communities work together and we have a draft of that. Yeah. So, so that draft is in your packet and I've addressed it to the police chiefs and the fire chiefs with CC to the selectmen of Lee and Medbury and the council in Durham. This letter is a direct result of the Homeland Security audits that were done in all of our schools now to date and in every single one of those Homeland Security audits, the recommendation was to have a uh, interoperability agreement slash memorandum of understanding among all um, police departments and fire departments relative to servicing all of our schools should uh, any of our schools need um, um, uh, support. So um, basically what that means is we'd be asking the department in Lee to go on record that they would come to Durham and Medbury. We'd be asking the departments in Durham to be on record to come and support Lee and Medbury. We'd be asking the departments in Medbury to be on record to come and support Lee and Durham. Um, the school system in Exeter has five separate school boards and six different towns, and they hired a retired police chief of Exeter, Chief Kane, to build this interoperability memorandum of agreement among six, six different, uh, five different school boards and six different towns. We have one school board and three towns. So this should be a very doable um, exercise and I'm hoping that the police chiefs and fire chiefs will um, be supportive of this and we can pull them together sooner rather than later. As you can see in the letter, I've actually suggested some dates for, for this meeting. And I also would be reaching out to Chief Kane in Exeter. I asked the Exeter school system if that would be an option and uh, they've said absolutely. So we could bring in a chief who's done it and helped help us build this memorandum of understanding among the three towns. So the draft is there. I'm open to any comments or suggestions. I see Kenny's got his red pen out. So here we go. <laughs> oh, I, I think the letter is excellent and I just um, wanted to also give kudos because you're including in the letter the UNH police. Right. which is very important as well because they're very strategically located. Well, the, the re the even more so, Ken, um, if Suzanne needed to vacate the high school and the middle school wasn't an option, our backup is the university. Mm -hmm. So we have an understanding with the university of, or if both the middle school and high school had to get off of co-drive and, and go on to the university, um, that is an option that exists in our current plan. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's critical that the chief at UNH be part of the conversation. Yeah, I think it's excellent. Thank yes, you for doing that. I have a motion to, do you need an authorization? Then? I have a quick, you quick question. Me to draft it, Brian. How is that, how is, is this more of a plan than it is a mutual aid agreement? Because I know they have mutual aid agreements with each other. But we don't have mutual aid agreements with each other. Some of us have mutual aid agreements and some of us don't. Of the three towns? Yes. Really? Yes. That's and surprising. um, yeah. And so this is actually saying as a school system, we're, we're, we would love to have a mutual aid agreement among the three towns to support the school system. Which would also support the three towns. Town. Right. You would think that if they do it for us, they'll do it for each other, but right. this is really about us. Okay. Yeah. So can I have a motion to authorize uh, Dr. Morse to send this letter? Brian? Make a motion to authorize Dr. Morse to send the letter. Moved by Brian, is there a second? Second by Al. Further discussion on this? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student up in favor. Okay, I'm gonna give myself an A plus, Ken. Yeah, you yeah, passed the test. I think it's an E. <laughs> Break seeds? Yes. All right, I'll take it. Uh, superintendent's oh, right. evaluation. Uh, I think the first step in the past has been to ask you to write yourself evaluation, so. Uh, I'm not sure what a good date would be for that, but because we have pretty much until into January to complete yeah. it, so but uh, two weeks, four weeks. Would uh, how about if how about if I have it done by the second meeting in December, just based on the workload that I see in front sure. of us? Sure, I think that would be fine. Okay, and then we yep. might have a non-public that night just to mm -hmm. take the next steps. Okay, uh, already 
approve the middle school site. Uh, we have, need a motion to approve two uh, Oyster River Middle School maternity leave, leave of absences. I think we could maybe do those as a block unless somebody wants to separate those out. Pretty much similar request. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the two um, Oyster River Middle School maternity leave absences, uh, one from January to the end of the school year and the other from March to the end of the school year. Moved by Denise, is there a second? Second by Brian. Um, discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep, those maternity leaves are approved. Uh, motion to approve the Oyster River High School list of winner coach and List of winter coaches and volunteers. Yeah. Denise? I'll make a motion to approve the list of winter coach and volunteers for the Moved high school. Moved by Denise. Is there a second? Second by Al. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor of those positions are approved. Uh, so we have a list of policies, and Denise, I don't know if you want to take us through these. Or um, well, I'll make a motion. I, I'll make a motion for uh, do them as a block, unless anybody has wants to split one out. All right. So I motion to approve policy J I C F A student hazing policy E H A A computer security email and internet communications, and policy I H B G home education for second read. Is there a second? A second. Second by Dan. Questions about these? No? Okay. All those in favor of approving these three policies for second read, raise your hand. Seven in favor, the student rep in favor, those policies are approved. Okay. Um, school committee updates. Um, do you want to say something about the manifests? How is the chair tonight? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you want me to actually say something? Yeah, about you're the yeah, chair. Yes. The record. Oh, wow, man. It went great. <laughs> <laughs> um, other committees? <laughs> Congratulations on doing so well. <laughs> um, exactly. Other uh, committees to the bet? I think, I think the, uh, the uh, RESPA decks the negotiated meeting is the 19th, is that right? Yeah, we it's moved it. Yeah. Well, we're yeah. right. Yeah. So we have a we have another meeting for negotiations um, set up for the end of the month. Okay. Um, let's see if it's in my calendar yet. We just had to talk to them today. Um, it was another oversight on my part, not theirs. I'll get you those dates okay. tomorrow. So, oh, yeah. to 29th. 29th. 29th so. at 1.30. So we're uh, approaching the time to, to really have to wrap that up. Yes. This has been a fairly lengthy, compared to other negotiations, this has been a fairly lengthy one. And I think we're maybe within striking distance, but. I think so. I think that the, you know, the process, though lengthy, I think it was getting to know a new a negotiator on their side and working through some issues that um, we haven't seen typically from a RESPA in the past, and so I, I'm, uh, we we um, signed off on. Gee, it must be about nine tenths of the language the last time. I think we have some hanging language, and then just uh, just a little bit of hanging language, and then uh, we made our proposal on on um, salary and benefits. Uh, they're contemplating our offer, and so I think we're really close to coming to mm -hmm. to the end. If it's not this meeting, for sure, one, Probably one more meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. Other committees? No, I, okay. I just had a question, um, and, and realizing it's not a, um, there's no rush, um, but we talked about the Orchard Drive, and was wondering if <coughs> more you had time to yep. follow um, up about So Dennis and I are meeting Friday morning uh, for breakfast and going over it. Uh, he did send me an apology email by the, the next day because I had said it was a $100,000 offer that he made and he corrected me and said it was 150. He sent me an email the next day and said, you were right. He said, I was thinking I had offered 150, but I didn't. And so I wanted to make sure you knew that. And I said, there's no problem, Dennis. Um, so we'll have breakfast on Friday. Um, um, Sue has um, gathered a, a, a bunch of contacts for me, so I'll talk through Dennis and those contacts, and um, we'll start going down the path to see if we can um, 
get some nominal amount for the property and put it into uh, a conservatorship. Okay, and, and certainly I'd be happy to share some contacts. What are you doing Friday for breakfast? Probably, what time is your breakfast? 7.30. <laughs> um, I'll be at work. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I can give you yeah, that'd the be names. Great, Ken. Yeah, thank you. Did we have any headway with the student senate and getting finding? I know you guys are in the middle of so much right now, but yeah, yeah. I just don't want it to be off the radar. Yeah, no, I was just writing my note, writing myself a note to do that. Um, I had talked to them recently, but we had a student senate meeting the same day that National Honor Society had a meeting, so there were only five people at that meeting. <laughs> so um, yeah, whatever works for you guys. Yeah, I've got a. Keep okay. asking Mr. Kangelo when, when works for him. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, so public comment is there, looks like. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. One last thing. I also wanted to thank Sarah Kuhn, um, who's running the middle school musical this year, which will be in January. Just so you guys are aware, she had 90 kids show up for oh. the original process. I think there's still something like 85 who are involved in the process. Oh. She has triple cast the show so that each kid who's got a lead is a lead for one of the three major performances and then also one of the school-based performances um, and is reaching out for additional support. I know she's got some other teachers in the school and other parents working collaboratively with her, but just so you guys are aware, this is not a small undertaking and I think it shows how many kids in our district are passionate about drama and how much we need more support for that. Thank you. What is That's the musical? Right. I just want to say, oh. uh, Lauren, that you put that issue in front of us last year and we did bring in additional support, so. Yes, thank you. And, and clearly she went from 40 kids last year to 90 this year, I think. Um, Maybe okay. it's something that should get added to the curriculum. What is the musical? They're gonna do um, the Little Mermaid, I think it's Little Mermaid Junior as opposed to the full production. Um, I, 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 I know it's Little Mermaid, I don't know the exact specifics. Mm -hmm. So, And oh. it'll be, the performances are in January. She um, delayed it till January to make it so that parents didn't have so many obligations in December to try to balance it out. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're meeting tomorrow at the Lee Complex for the budget workshop and the other meetings. And, and also we'll have a meeting next week because we decided not to go right before uh, uh, Thanksgiving. So we'll be meeting next week. Uh, but we'll be meeting here, right? Yes, here, here. next week. So okay. it's not, not at the, Mass Way. It's yeah. not at Mass Way, it's here. And then the December, first December meeting will be at Mass Way. That's the point. December 5th would be Mass Way. Yeah. And Oh and you're off to and off to Washington off to on Washington Tuesday. For the it's superintendent of the year. The last hurrah as superintendent of the year. Wow! Well, congratulations. Be enjoy, enjoy your enjoy your trip. You still I haven't brought the bell in. Yeah. Don't um, forget your snow goggles for the champagne. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. What did you say? <laughs> you need, said, you need your goggles for the champagne. Yeah, guys, exactly. Right? That's right. Right. Burns. <laughs> Burns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. It's friends like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, motion to adjourn. I'm up so to moved. adjourn. Motion moved by Al, second by Brian. All in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor, student rep in favor. We are adjourned. Awesome.